morning, church family. You know, I've encountered, encountered quite a few people through the years who've claimed to be prophets who speak for God. For example, there was the guy in my home church in the 1980s who said he was a prophet. Um, and he predicted that God was going to send a massive earthquake on Los Angeles during the 1984 Summer Olympics in L.A. And he even passed out copies of his prophecy to the members of the congregation that I was at. Um, and when no earthquake happened, he said that it was because people prayed in response to his prophecy and averted the earthquake. And even as a fairly new Christian, that seemed a little sketchy to me. But then there was in 1990, and I was uh, 27 years old. I was in my very first pastoral calling as an associate pastor. Um, and the wife of that church's lead pastor had a dream that she believed was prophetic. And in her dream, I was that church's lead pastor instead of her husband. And so she woke up from her dream and told her husband about the dream. And then a few days later, he told me about the dream. And they were both convinced that it was a message from God. And so the lead pastor went to their elders, told them about his wife's dream, and offered to resign and step down as lead pastor. And within a couple of months, at the ripe, mature age of 28... Um, that church called me as their new lead pastor, and the former lead pastor took a role as an associate pastor, and we served together for 15 years together at that congregation, all because of a dream. When I was going through a divorce in 2006, quite a few self-proclaimed prophets came to me with messages claiming to be from God. Um, some were general words of comfort and encouragement. Others made bold predictions that never took place. One told me that I'd never be a pastor again. During the pandemic in 2020, here at Glenkirk, I received an anonymous typewritten prophecy in the mail. And this self-proclaimed prophet denounced me as a satanic false shepherd and predicted that God was going to rain down judgment on me and on our congregation. What are we to make of people who come to us with messages that they say are from God? How do we deal with people who are self-proclaimed prophets? Well, today we finish our summer series, teaching series, Truth to Power, through the Old Testament books of First and Second Kings. And in this series, we've noted that there are 10 different prophets named um, by name in First and Second Kings, and that each one spoke God's truth to power in their own unique way. And since this is the final Sunday in the series, let me just sum up what we've learned. Um, from the prophet Nathan, we saw that the future belongs to God and that God can be trusted with the future. God's people don't have to scheme or plot or try to grab the future for themselves because the future already belongs to God. From the prophet Ahijah, we saw that God's grace is not a license for sin, but instead God's grace is a call to obedience. From the prophet Shemaiah, we saw that pride divides God's people, but humility unites God's people. From the prophet Jehu, we saw that God is our true king. From the prophet Elijah, we saw that the true God blesses God's people. From the prophet Micaiah, we saw that speaking God's truth to power sometimes comes at a cost. From the prophet Elisha, we saw that no one but God is indispensable to God's plan. From the prophet Jonah, we saw that sometimes God has to confront us with our own bias in order for God to use us in God's plan. And then last week, from the prophet Isaiah and his words to King Hezekiah, we saw that God answers prayers. And today we finish our series by looking at the tenth and final prophet named my name in these books, a prophet named Huldah. Of the ten prophets mentioned in First and Second Kings, Huldah is the only woman. 
And through the prophet Huldah, we're going to see the power of God's word. And so I want to invite you, if you're able to stand, would you stand with me as we hear from God's word, 2 Kings chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah, and she was from Boscath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Now down to verse 8. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from the book in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Akbor, son of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and Asiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what has been written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbar, Shaphan, and Asiah went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who is the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Tell the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything in the book that the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. But tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. It's the word of the Lord. You can be seated. We're we're introduced here to King Josiah. Josiah was the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah, who we met last week. And Josiah was only eight years old when he became the king of the southern nation of Israel, the nation of Judah. And he reigned for 31 years. And verse 2 tells us that Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Of the roughly 40 different kings and a couple of queens mentioned in 1st and 2nd Kings, the vast majority of them were Godless, ruthless, obsessed with their own power, violent and unfaithful to God. It was a regular game of thrones back then. But like his great-grandfather Hezekiah, Josiah was one of the few exceptions. During Josiah's reign, the Jewish temple was being renovated. And as it's being renovated, the high priest discovers the book of the law. Now, the book of the law here is probably the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy is the only book in the Bible referred to as the book of the law. 
Now remember that back then, books were handwritten scrolls rather than a bound papyrus of printed pages like we have today. And so this scroll was discovered after it had been lost by workers as they're renovating the temple. Now most likely, Josiah's grandfather, when Manasseh, when he was king, this scroll had been lost or hidden. After all, Manasseh was the worst of all of Judah's kings, leading the people headlong into rebellion against God and unfaithfulness of the covenant promises the people had made to God. So we wouldn't have taken too kindly to the book of Deuteronomy laying around, which stipulates how Israel was supposed to be living. But Manasseh is now long gone, and this scroll is discovered that turns out to be the book of the law. I wonder if the scroll was covered in thick layer of dust, if its papyrus paper was cracked, if the handwritten ink faded. After all, it had been laying there lost for 50 years. The high priest takes the scroll to Shaphan, who is an official in Josiah's government, and then Shaphan reads the scroll to King Hezekiah. And, or to King Josiah. And Josiah is upset by what he hears. You see, Deuteronomy outlines what God expects of God's people. For them to love God with their whole hearts and to love their neighbor as themselves. Deuteronomy includes the moral standards for God's people. The Ten Commandments are found in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. And the final chapters of Deuteronomy include a series of blessings that God promises to send on God's people if they are faithful to their covenant promises, and a series of curses that will happen if they are unfaithful to those promises. And that series of curses includes invasion by their enemies, destruction of the land, and going into exile. In fact, chapter 30 of Deuteronomy ends this way in verses 19 and 20. This day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you, Israel, life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. When Josiah hears these words, he realizes that his people have been choosing death instead of life, curses instead of blessings. As Josiah says in verse 13, those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. And so Josiah orders his officials to find a prophet and inquire from God about what to do now. How do they make this right? And this leads them to Huldah and her prophecy. Now, I find it interesting that although Huldah is a woman, the author of 2 Kings doesn't say anything to try to explain or justify Huldah's ministry as a prophet. The author just matter-of-factly tells us that they inquired of the Lord of the prophet Huldah, and here's her family background, like the author does with all the prophets that have come before. Bible scholar Claudia Camp says that apparently back then, Prophecy was one vocation that was open to women on an equal basis to men. Now, centuries later, much, much later, many Jewish rabbis would be really bothered by the fact that Huldah was a woman. Um, and as you can probably guess, these later Jewish rabbis were all men because women weren't allowed to be rabbis at that time. And so some of these rabbis speculated that they went to Huldah because all the other prophets were out of town that day. But that is not what the author of 2 Kings says. 2 Kings presents Huldah on the same level as all the prophets that have come before her in 2 and 1 Kings. Prophets like Nathan and Jonah, Elijah, and Elisha. And Huldah reiterates what the earlier prophets had said about Israel going all the way back to what Ahijah says in 1 Kings chapter 14. And according to Huldah, in this prophecy, God's judgment is going to come on the southern nation of Judah because of their unfaithfulness to their covenant promises to God. The curses of Deuteronomy would eventually fall upon the southern nation. And 35 years after Huldah gives these words, 
the Babylonians would invade Judah, lay siege to Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people into exile in fulfillment of Huldah's prophecy. But then Huldah offers a word of hope to Josiah and his generation. Because Josiah's heart was responsive, and because he humbled himself when he heard the book of the law, he and his generation would not experience the disaster that's coming. The word in verse 19, the Hebrew word translated responsive, means soft or tender. Josiah's heart was tender towards the written word that had been discovered. And so Huldah tells Josiah that he would be buried in peace. Now, in the next chapter, Josiah is actually killed in battle by an Egyptian king named Necho. Not exactly a peaceful way to go. But Huldah's promise that he'd be buried in peace is probably a reference to Josiah's legacy as one of the few good and godly kings of that time. So what are we to make of this tenth and final prophet? that we encounter in First and Second Kings. In the Woman's Bible Commentary, Claudia Camp points out that Huldah is the only prophet in First and Second Kings whose words are closely aligned with the written words of God. And I think that's significant. It's significant because it reveals that there is an important relationship between what God reveals in the written word with what God speaks through the prophets. Many of the Protestant reformers um, of the 15th and 16th century said that prophecy today in the church is mostly about the preaching and teaching and application of God's word to God's people. John Calvin wrote that prophecy in this day is hardly anything else but the right understanding of Scripture and explaining it to people. And the famous uh, Reformed book on preaching by William Perkins is called The Art of Prophesying. In other words, explaining and applying the Bible to other people is an important part of prophecy. Now, I certainly would not rule out God speaking a unique word to people through someone today. That dream from the associate pastor's wife certainly seemed prophetic and led to my first calling as a lead pastor. But I would say that any spoken prophecy must always stand under the scrutiny of God's written word. Huldah's ministry reminds us of the power of the written word of God. And I think we can find at least three ways the power of God's written word can be unleashed in our lives as followers of Jesus today. Here's the first way. For God's word to have power in our lives, we must know the word. We must know the word for it to have power in our lives. Josiah and the people of his generation didn't know the word. It was lost. It was hidden away. It, was, it had a thick layer of dust and no one had consulted it for 50 years. During the 16th century Reformation, many Christians in Europe were like the people of Josiah's generation. God's word had been translated from its original Greek and Hebrew into Latin in the 4th century. But in the 16th century... Most people living in Europe didn't know Latin. And back then, that was before the invention of the printing press, so people didn't have personal Bibles at home that they could read. They had to go to church in order to hear about the Bible and hear it taught. But when the word was read in Latin, a language they didn't understand, people didn't know the word. And part of the Reformation throughout Europe was to translate the Bible into the common languages of ordinary people. And then with the invention of the printing press, to make that distributing available to anybody who wanted it. Because for God's Word to have power, we must know the Word. Today, we don't have the same problem they had in Josiah's day or in 16th century Europe. We're Bible rich today. We have several translations in our language. We have Bible apps and Bible software programs. And yet many Christians today are still pretty ignorant of the word. Most would struggle to name all four gospels or even half of the Ten Commandments. 
Hard to live by the Ten Commandments if you don't know what they are. About 39% of Americans are regular Bible readers, and that means that they read the Bible um, three to four times a week outside of church. But that number every year is consistently dropping. From 2021 to 2022, the number of regular Bible readers in America dropped by 26 million people. and continues to drop. And one of the reasons why our teaching here at Glenkirk is so Bible-focused is because we want people to know the Word. Our pastors don't traffic in human interest stories or give political pep rallies or inspirational TED Talks. Instead, we, we teach from the written Word because there's power in the written Word, but we have to know it. And many people who end up coming off the rails when it comes to modern-day messages from God are people who don't know the Word very well. Because the less we know about the written word, the more vulnerable we are to strange and crazy ideas. But the more we know about the written word, the less vulnerable we are. For God's word to have power in our lives, we have to know the word. Secondly, for God's word to have power in our lives, we must open our hearts to the word. Open our hearts to the word. I love Holda's statement in verse 19 again. Josiah's heart was responsive. It was tender. It was pliable. It was soft. Josiah wasn't trying to use the word to justify what he and his people were doing. He didn't see the word as a weapon to try to wield against his enemies. Instead, Josiah's heart was open and responsive to what the word was saying to him personally. For God's word to have power in your life and in my life, our hearts need to be open and responsive to what it's saying to us. It means being willing to change in response to the Word. It means having some of our assumptions challenged, our ideas questioned, our decisions scrutinized. There's an ancient African theologian and pastor named Athanasius, and he used to tell the people in his congregation that to benefit from the Word, they need to read it with a good heart and a pure soul. Josiah had a good heart and a pure soul. See, most of us read the Bible with our minds, but not always with our hearts. We focus on the ideas we read and how those ideas fit together. And don't get me wrong, it's important that we use our minds when we read the Word for us to accurately interpret the Word. We certainly shouldn't turn off our minds when we read the Word, but we can't neglect our hearts as well. How can we cultivate Josiah's responsive heart? I think part of it is preparing ourselves to hear the word. Praying and inviting God to soften and cleanse our hearts before we read the word or before we hear it taught by our pastors. Because we're often quick to apply the word to someone else, someone sitting next to us. But sometimes we're slow to see how it applies to ourselves. And so if we find ourselves defensive when we read something or when one of our pastors teaches us something, rather than writing it off, spend time with that defensiveness. Be curious. Ask God, where is this coming from? Because for God's word to have power in our lives, we need responsive hearts. And then finally, thirdly, for God's word to have power in our lives, we must humbly obey the word. Humbly obey the word. It's not enough to just know it and open our hearts to it. We have to take the step of obedience. After they found the scroll of the law in the temple, Josiah led the people through a massive campaign to bring their lives into conformity with the word. You can read about this in the rest of chapter 2 and chapter 23. And Josiah's reforms included gathering all the people together to renew their covenant promises to God. That's what we've done today by saying the Apostles' Creed, renewing our faith today. That's what our new covenant partners and those baptized have done today. Renewed their promises, their covenant promises to God. Josiah's reforms also included getting rid of all the false worship in Judah and restoring the celebration of the Passover. See, if all we do is know the word, 
and open our hearts to it, but we don't actually obey the word, we rob ourselves of its power in our lives. We won't grow in our faith. We won't develop in our character. We won't experience victory in our struggles. We'll be stuck, content to absorb more and more knowledge, but never taking the step of obedience. We'll be like the people Paul describes in 2 Timothy 3.7, who are always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. We'll be like the people that James describes in James 1, when he says that anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at their face in a mirror, and after looking at themselves, goes away and immediately forgets what they saw. My friends, that is no way to live the Christian life. God's word has power. But to experience that power, we have to know it. Open our hearts to it. And actually start obeying it. The prophet Huldah knew this. Which is why she called Josiah and his generation back to God's written word. And the more we respond to God's written word, the better we'll be able to discern it when people come to us claiming to have messages from God. I mean, if someone comes to us claiming to have a message from God, we we shouldn't completely dismiss the person, but we also shouldn't take everything they say, hook, line, and sinker. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but instead test them and hold on to what's good. How do we test them? By putting them under the scrutiny of God's written word. We might find that some messages that claim to come from God really are like the dream that lead pastor's wife had. But we might find that other messages aren't from God, no matter how sincere and convincing the person is who shares it with us. And often we might find that it's a little bit from God and maybe a little bit not. That's what testing is. And so as we finish our Truth to Power series... The tenth and ultimate prophet that we encounter aptly reminds us to live under the authority of the written word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Hulda and for her ministry. And we thank you for her word of hope to Josiah and his desire to live under the word. And God, that is our desire as well as individuals, as a church family, that we might live our lives under the authority and scrutiny of your written word, that it might change us, that it might grow us, that we might become all that you have for us to be, because you have spoken through your word. Help us listen. Amen.